tasteless, colorless, shouts and sport and laughter, health and happiness and life itself. And then, all of a sudden, death, as water shows its other face, hideous, unrelenting, shrieking its rage, the vicious scourge of mankind, burying life and land under its relentless and merciless depths. This is the story of such water, and its mastery by the determined hand of man. Everything was lovely in Florida, so it seemed. The sun was kind, the surf was fresh, the beaches white and clean. To millions of Americans, it was Valhalla, the nation's playtime paradise, the place where all was right and nothing was wrong. Beautiful, carefree, the land that nature always smiled upon, so it seemed. But once you got past the surf and the shore, the glittering jewel face of the side hard by the sea, there was trouble. Nature was frowning. The trouble was water. Too much of it on one hand, not enough of it on the other. When the rains came, they inundated the flat lowlands of central and southern Florida, overfilling the inland waters, flooding the rich soils, destroying crops, turning hard-earned farm profits into devastating losses, covering towns, ruining homes and businesses and roads, wrecking a desperate havoc that ran into millions upon millions of dollars a year doing a damage that could never be repaired, never replaced, never be the same again. Millions of dollars being flooded away, a great treasure literally buried in its own silent grave. And when the rains had left, there was no water. There was drought, arid land, leached and sucked dry. Once lush farmland, now reduced to dry dust by the crazed antics of the elements. When the earth was wrung dry and the only moisture left was in the sweat and tears of those who made the land their living, there spread over the reddened horizons the last climactic blow from the maddened forces of nature, fire. Across the land it came, burning the peat soils, leaving a waste and a desolation that was now almost absolute. And when it was over, it started again. The rains, the floods, the drought, the fire. Central and southern Florida just lay there, waiting helplessly to be soaked and dried and burned out again. And slowly, life was leaving her. Why should it be? Why should it happen here? Happen in a state so amply blessed with splendid resources, everything needed for prosperity and progress. Why? It was simply the nature of the land itself. Central and southern Florida is barely above sea level, and the heavy rainfall that is so unevenly distributed through the year quickly fills the flat terrain. Then when the water drains off, it dries out quickly under the fierce eye of an all-season sun. Obviously, if the water was in the right place at the right time, if the excess water could be removed in a hurry, then brought in when it was needed, central and southern Florida would flower upon the seeds of its own rich resources. Remove it in a hurry. Bring it in when you need it. A large order for any one spot. But here we're talking about some 15,000 square miles, an area twice the size of New Jersey. Something had to be done and something was. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was assigned the mission of planning and designing a complete project for flood control throughout the district, then proceed to build it. 
Next, a special public agency was formed by the state, an agency called the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control District. Its job, to coordinate the efforts of state and local interest and provide necessary lands for construction. In other words, help clear the way for the Corps of Engineers. Together, they had their work cut out for them. Let's take a look at the problem. To call it a vast one is actually an understatement. The area takes in about one-fourth of the entire state, more than one-third the population, and represents much of the finest crop and pasture land in Florida. The liquid heart of this area is Lake Okeechobee, the big water, 730 square miles of it, the second largest freshwater lake wholly within the United States. This monster had to be controlled by bigger levees and by bigger canals that would give it bigger outlets to the sea. That went for the other lakes too. More levees and improved channels and water controls to discharge the floodwaters as fast as possible. In the Everglades, more levees and canals to maintain proper water levels. And here in these counties, Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade, three great conservation pools to store surplus water, 1,340 square miles of it. There it was, the master plan, comprehensive in scope, but still only on paper. So monumental, so complex was this project that its detailed planning and construction by the Corps of Engineers would take many years to develop. The federal government was solidly behind it. All it took for the engineers to get started was cooperative action by local interests. This action consisted of furnishing the necessary land, easements and rights of way, percentage of the construction costs, and the pledge to operate and maintain the works after they were completed. When it comes right down to the overall cost of the entire project, local interests will pay over 40 percent, 40 percent of the cost. The pattern was set. All that had to be done was build the reservoirs, the channels, the levees, the spillways, the pumping stations, the gates, the saltwater barriers, the whole integrated system of water controls. That's all. The engineers went to work. No time was lost. The first job that was tackled was construction of levees between the Everglades and the coast. 125 miles of them, from just south of Miami, up to a point west of Palm Beach, and on to Lake Okeechobee. This was tough going. The lime rock under the soil had to be blasted out. And many a drill point was dulled in attempts to burrow the way for dynamite. Foot by foot, mile by mile, the work went on. Drilling, blasting, digging, bite by bite. Five to eight cubic yards per mouthful. Slowly, persistently gouging the bottom to build up the top. to watch your step. Progress usually finds anger in its path, and some of it along the palmettos and in the waters is deadly. It's a long way, 125 miles, when you're moving bite by bite. When it was finished, they turned to the next job and began again, bite by bite. This is a project of mammoth proportions, one that calls for more than 700 miles of new levees throughout the central and southern Florida area. Altogether, the entire project tackled represents one of the largest earth-moving jobs since the digging of the Panama Canal. So the next time you see a giant drag line or pipeline dredge chewing the rock from a project canal, think of the progress that's already been made and the work that lies ahead. Lines on a map are a simple thing. It's out there that the real work's done. Well done.
But that's just part of it. Canals and levees are fine for the overflow, but we've got to control the water, make it do our bidding. This takes pumping stations, spillways and dams all the way from the upper reaches of the Kissimmee River Basin down to the southern tip of the mainland of Florida. That's a large order. A pumping station, for instance, is no sense to build. It's got a big job to do. In effect, it speeds the flow of water just as an electric fan moves the air faster. You've got to get down to bedrock to pour the foundation. There must be nothing flimsy about this kind of installation. Thousands of cubic yards of concrete are shaped by huge forms, and beneath the thick skin face of the structure, reinforcing steel gives it a strength that will withstand the winds and waters of the hurricanes and the vicious storms to come. Each station is independent of local power. Its own generating plant produces the electricity it needs. In fact, each is actually an island unto itself, a place where the folks who run it ride out the severest blows of nature, keeping the pumps going and the waters moving to thwart the floods that used to devastate the lands around them. There are many major pumping stations throughout the central and southern Florida flood control project. Right now, this one's the largest. A giant that can remove over two million gallons of water a minute. That's right, two million gallons a minute. When you figure about 10 or 20 gallons to fill up your bathtub, you can imagine how much water this is. But you've got to have that kind of action to get heavy rainfalls off this kind of land. Gravity just won't do it. But you don't do a job like this with ordinary equipment. Take these conduits, for instance, too large to bring in by rail or by road. Made in Jacksonville, they were brought down the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway, the St. Lucie Canal, across Lake Okeechobee, down the North New River Canal, and through the Everglades Agricultural Area. Bridges had to be lifted to permit passage of this clumsy cargo. Well, these canals weren't really built to handle this kind of traffic. 400 miles they came to this station, and now they're helping remove water from the surrounding soils, keeping it in a conservation area for storage. Water waiting to be used when needed. Not much to do when you work out here, that is, in the city sense of doing things. But many folks spend many dollars looking for natural beauty of this sort. For the unspoiled wonders of nature, where the sun is clean and the air is fresh. That flapping you hear is the beating wings of wildlife. And the fishing, superb. Knock off work and go catch your dinner. It's a simple life and a sporting one. Especially when you land one like this. But most of the time, it's hard work. Plain, hard driving work, where schedules must always be met, where the steel and the concrete and the piping and the wiring must all come together within a limit of time and a budget of money. Other structures for water controls are also going up. Systems to regulate the discharge of water, prevent over drainage, and keep salt water from fresh groundwaters used by the coastal cities. More than 15,000 square miles of central and southern Florida flood control district are being studded by the mechanical restraints of man. The central and southern Florida project, big as it is, is only the basic system for water control. Outside of it, individuals and sub-districts are providing the secondary works. Things like mole drains. private pumping stations, farm dikes and ditches. The big project makes it possible for folks to complete their water control needs. Water is available in project canals, but they've got to take it out and distribute it. Works the other way too. If folks get too much water on their land during the rainy season, 
their private pumps can send it back to the canals. The great conservation areas to the southeast make use of land that isn't suited to agriculture. They keep the areas to the southeast make use of land that isn't suited to agriculture. They keep the water. It drains here from the lakes and rivers and the canals. Water that once ran wild. Water that ruined the rich terrain. Water that took lives and land put disaster in the headlines and death upon the soil. Now, it just waits there, calm, peaceful, ready to do the bidding of man and his machine. Oh, there are still heavy rains. Where the project's been completed, the dams will control them and the spillways release them and the canals take them on, sending them to the appointed areas. And they lie there, waiting. So they wait, the waters, there in the great natural reservoir of Lake Okeechobee. Now they wait for the warnings of drought. And when it comes, they go off to spread life among the dried up soils. Life brought on demand. And no longer do the waters inundate these lands. No longer do they rot the crops. No longer do they saturate and destroy the riches in the deep of the land. And downstate, water, now in the conservation areas, irrigates the coastal lands, stops the shrinking of the soil, helps preserve water supplies to cities, draws the wildlife to the protection of its still and quiet surface. And it's a beautiful bonus. Wildlife, displaced by Florida's burgeoning population, has found a home here. Game that now finds sanctuary in a wildlife paradise, controlled by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Florida State Game and Freshwater Fish Commission for conservation purposes. Much has been done. Central and Southern Florida is no longer nature's fool. The stooge for the impractical jokes of the elements. But the work isn't finished. In fact, it's just really begun. To the north, for instance, the great valley of the upper St. John's is still somewhat defenseless. And plans for water controls, levees, and conservation areas are now in the engineering stage. The Army engineers and the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control District won't waste any time getting the job done, however, once appropriations are made. Westward from the St. John's, the Kissimmee River flows south into Lake Okeechobee. Its headwaters are a chain of lakes connected by a number of canals. Works now underway, which will enlarge these canals to permit a more rapid removal of floodwaters to Lake Okeechobee. And that means enlarging, controlling, and straightening this famous Crooked River so that it can take the water smoothly all the way down to the big waters of Lake Okeechobee. The whole thing, the complete project, once only lines on a map, pencil tracings on paper, is slowly becoming reality as real as steel and concrete. Slowly, yes, because programs of this immense size take time, and they take people and money, and the heart and the will to see that it all comes true. Is it worth it? Well, that's an easy one. Look around central and southern Florida today, and what do you see? For one thing, you see cattle country, an empire that has fast become a leader in livestock. Wrangling's no longer confined to the west. The lush grasses of this green district graze some of the finest livestock in America. Cattle that grows fat without supplemental food come winter or summer. Why, they've even got some of the fanciest rodeos this side of the Wyoming Trail. Fancier, maybe. This may be Florida, but these fellows are no beachcombers. They're cowboys. Just ask those doggies out there. So it's cattle country, but that's just part of it. When you've got soil like this is, black and fertile and deep, you can really grow things. 
For these always have been real farmland. The soil, the sunshine, the perfect year-round temperatures have always been here. And so have the rich crops. But the risk has been here too. The gamble against the elements. The probability that the rain would take everything you've grown, everything you've done, and literally turn it into water. Look at it. Once upon a time, this may have been underwater, and later it could have been dried out as stiff as a rag on a clothesline. Now it's lush all the time, and the harvests that come out of these warm soils feed many millions of people all over our nation. Out of this land come the many crops of fresh vegetables each winter, when most of the rest of the nation is generally too cold for such produce. New York, South Bend, Minneapolis, they've got at least one thing in common, fresh vegetables from central and southern Florida. Flowers from Florida too. Many of Flora sells bouquets that stem from the large commercial flower industries in South Florida. It's surprising how many different crops these rich low soils can grow. This one, for instance, Ramy, R-A-M-I-E, an ancient fiber product that used to be exclusively grown in China and India. Famous for its long wearing qualities, Ramy is used not only for cloth, but also for the manufacture of rope and cordage. And of course, you could say Florida is the fruit basket for America. Certainly, the 135 million boxes of citrus fruits it ships each year supplies a substantial portion of the country, not to mention the fruits that go into the can instead. Make no mistake about it, central Florida has always been a picture of bright orange and yellow against the green of its groves. But control of the waters, waters that were once a constant source of costly damage, has now added millions of dollars to citrus income alone, and most important, has brought more fruit for more people at cheaper prices all over America. Another tremendous benefit from water controls is the attraction of new industry. Before, you couldn't expect manufacturers to select sites that were apt to be flooded or where they might not get water when they needed it. Now they've come, and how they've come, bringing with them thousands of jobs and millions of dollars of additional income. If it weren't for the flood control project, many of them wouldn't be here. All the work on the project has really only begun. Results are already too good to be ignored. Fifty million dollars in crop damages has been saved. Fifty million dollars. This in only a few years of operation of a partially completed project. Think how much more will be saved. How many more hundreds of millions of dollars in the endless future before us? When you get past the saving, think of the making. The livestock industry, for instance, growing even more fantastically since the project was started, is contributing considerably to the assets of the area. So is industry by millions each year. More tourists have come. Cities have grown. Sport has been better than ever. Families safer than ever. As in all projects of this kind, the Army engineers have a method of figuring the advantages. It's called a benefit to cost ratio, a term for the comparison of benefits to costs, benefits that can be expected to occur to the people and to their land. Latest reports to Congress show that in the central and southern Florida project, there is now a benefit to cost ratio of four to one. For every dollar being spent, four dollars are coming back. That's a 400% return guaranteed by documented facts. And as any businessman knows, you can't do much better than that. The work goes on. The drilling, the digging, the placing, the forming. It goes on with the sure and complete knowledge that every dollar, every man hour of labor will be repaid several times over. There's a long way to go yet. The major part of the entire plan for central and southern Florida is yet to be done. But the very economics, 
the long-range benefits that have already come from what has been done are stark testimony to the need for such progress. Flood control must proceed as fast as humanly possible so that everyone, not only in this particular 15,000 square miles of land, but everyone everywhere can share in the rich results of man's mastery of the elements. Then it shall be that water, once the fierce, uncompromising enemy of this long, wide, low-lying land, will become its greatest ally. The rains may come, but there will be no fear in them. They are the waters of Florida's unfolding destiny, the bright promise of Florida's glowing future.